how what was the ne what was the next step though that got you in with Alan and and then recording? So uh, Bob Dole uh, took me around to all. There were seven major labels at the time, and uh, the seventh label, all seven labels passed. All of it was a no. They felt like George Strait was already here. I guess I a guy named Clint Black that was out that was just killing everything. And uh, I had an NSAI, a Nashville uh, Songwriters Association uh, thing to do. And uh, I didn't want to do it because it all passed on me. So there's no reason to do it. Bob said, you're going to keep your word. He said, just go play the gig. I thought, okay. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show up early in case somebody's not there. I was supposed to go on like 5th or 7th. And uh, in case somebody doesn't show up, I'm getting early and I'm getting out of there. Sure enough, Ralph Murphy, the Canadian, great Canadian artist. He's in the Canadian Country Music Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. He did not show up for that second slot. And the producer of the show saw me and said, hey, man, would you go on in Ralph's? So I said, you betcha. Went up there, played, was thinking I was getting ready to get out of there. When Lynn Schultz from Capitol Records came up to Bob and said, how did we leave this thing? And Bob, it, what he said in that next second changed everything. What he should have said was, you guys passed on us. But what Bob said was, uh, Lynn, you said you'd get back with us. They had passed on us already. Mm -hmm. And Lynn said, you know what? We might have missed something while you bring him in. So here it goes. So when we get our record deal, the first guy I go to is a guy that's been mentoring me this whole time. Jerry Kennedy, mm -hmm. because I know his boy Brian, and uh, hanging around, of course, everybody knows Gordon uh, because of the guitar work and the, and the songwriting thing he does. And then, of course, Shelby is already working his way into administration in this town. So you knew the whole family. And uh, when we went over there to tell him, we got signed by Capitol, he said, I'm out. I'm like, what? He says, I'm out. He goes, me and those guys don't get along. I said, are you kidding me? He goes, no. I said, well, I don't want to do this without you. He says, look, they're going to give you a list of about 10 names. Producers, bring that list over to me when they do. Sure enough, they gave me a list, about 10 names. He went over there, circled them, circled them, circled them. He said, any of these guys can see you, take it. One of those five names he had circled was Alan Reynolds. Alan was the first guy that could see us. So we went over to what was Jack's tracks. Right. At that time, we were 16th and Horton. Bob and I went upstairs talked to Alan. When I came out of the room, I looked at Bob. I said, no offense to the other guys, but if that guy wants to take it on, because that's a good dude, you can just feel it when you met him. And uh, it was good. And uh, so that's how it began for us. And Alan Reynolds was so sweet. He said, uh, I'll tell you what, I'll produce three songs on the guy. If the label doesn't like them, I'll buy them. I'll eat them. They'll be gone. And for somebody who didn't have any money, that was a big it was a big, huge step, and I said, thank you, I'll take you up on that, and uh, it was cool. And the first, uh, the first song we cut was Not Counting You, which turned out to be the first song on the first album and the opening song of the first tour. So that song, as little attention as it gets, played a huge role in our career. Alan signs you, or takes you in, how did you get the G-Men? So Alan and I are sitting and he goes, we're talking about players. I said, Alan, there's only one guy that's been on every session for me, demos, everything that I need. I said, it's, and he, he's the bass player. And Alan kind of smiles at me and he says, the only guy that I'm going to hold tight on is the bass player too. And I thought, well, we're dead. And I, I said, it was Mike Chapman. And he, it's cool. He spun his paper around, pushed it over. And in bass, he has Mike Chapman. Mm. So that was a good thing right there. Mm -hmm. That's when he told me about Mike has a brother from another mother kind of thing, a guy named Milton Sledge. Kind of, they breathe in, breathe out together, mm -hmm. Muscle Shoals guys. Mm -hmm. He says, I use a guy named Chris Lusinger on uh, all the crystal stuff. He says, I really feel like he's got a sound that's untapped and can go a lot, uh, can expand out a lot further that you want to go. Um, I said, okay. He said, how about piano playing? He says, it's got to be Bobby Wood. He said, Bobby Wood's got the touch that, that you'll like. Because, you know, you're doing uh, kind of guitar demos with him. He said, I'm going to try a guy named Mark Cass Stevens on acoustic. And we tried Mark. And he also liked uh, Christopher, Johnny Christopher. 
And he also liked Pat Alger, who was right in the building as a writer for him anyway. And uh, funny, we ended up using Christopher and Alger on the Thunder Rolls and used Johnny Christopher on Unanswered Prayers and then brought Cass Stevens back to overdub on it and kind of stayed with Cass Stevens uh, from there forward. And then um, the only guy that, you know, had left were the two specialty guys, Steel and Fiddle. And uh, he'd brought in Buddy Spiker. Buddy Spiker was a great guy. But Rob had done all of our demos mm -hmm. for us. And so he said, you want to give your guy a chance? I said, I'd love to. Rob came in and, and Alan just fell in love with him. They communicated very well. Come to find out Rob is classically trained. Talk about a hillbilly fiddler, but he's classically trained. So him and Alan were on perfect wavelength. And then Bruce Bowden, steel player, he'd done some stuff for Kathy Matea, which Alan was doing as well. And uh, he said, this cat's got a really kind of a smooth style and he can play all kinds of steel styles from Western Swing, straight country, and uh, he's from the East, he's from Virginia, so he also knows the Appalachian stuff and stuff too, so it was cool, man, and that was the assemblance of the G-Man, the seven guys. One of the most important one, though, was the guy that sat at the board. It was Mark Miller, mm -hmm. and uh, Mark was just somebody that, that Alan found that loved music, was a guitar player himself, and a good one, uh, but they got along great, and Alan trusted Mark's hearing for mic for miking stuff and also his his specialty was mixing man unbelievable mixer and, and alan would never let him use automation so he had to play his board like the guys mm -hmm. played their instrument so when we all sit up here on the stage i looked around and said this is good that all these guys were included i forgot one guy in the whole thing that should have been in with the g-man because without without this person my sound would not be what it was I looked right at her, and it's Tricia. Yeah. She sang on over 77 songs of ours, of the first 100 ones. So she has been that Garth sound forever. That's that harmony, that's that sound. And that's the only regret I had from that night was she should have been in on it because, man, background vocalists, and even though she's an artist herself, background vocals like Patty Love's assist events, mm -hmm. you don't get to where you're at without those singers and those voices. Same way you don't get to where you're at without those guitar players and those drummers. So uh, that was my only miss for the night, but that's the G-Men, including Mark Miller and Alan Reynolds, and uh, just uh, I'm lucky to have known them uh, in a pretty damn good time for us and for country music. I think everybody feels the same way. Hey!